Hello, I'm Pastor John Rickard of Our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Newark, Delaware. The following sermon was delivered January 5th, 2020 by the head of our worship committee because I was on vacation. I'm now reading it. We celebrated it as Epiphany Sunday, transferring the holiday to this particular Sunday. Our elections were Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 6, Psalm 72, verses 1 through 15, and the antiphon was verse 18. Our epistle lesson was Ephesians 3, 1 through 12, and our gospel lesson was Matthew 2, 1 through 12. The sermon is titled, What is Epiphany? And the text was Genesis, uh, Ephesians 3, 16. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's message is taken from our epistle lesson. I read again Ephesians 3, 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. While Epiphany is actually tomorrow, January 6th, we have transferred its observance to today. Today is actually the last Sunday of Christmas tide, also called Twelfth Night, because it is the twelfth and last day of Christmas. It is the traditional day we take down our Christmas decorations, both in our homes and our churches. So, following today's worship service, we will remove our Christmas decorations from our church. Epiphany is a Greek word and literally means manifestation. That name naturally brings up the question, what is being made manifest? Originally, the feast celebrated the ways that Jesus was manifest as God in the flesh. So it actually included the birth of Jesus along with the angel's proclamation that the baby was to be called Christ the Lord. In fact, he actually was Christ the Lord. It, is also, it also included the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan by John when the father of Jesus said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. It included Jesus' first miracle at the wedding feast in Canaan, when he turned water into wine. At this event, the Apostle John wrote, This is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. It also included the Christmas star and the visit of the wise men. Epiphany was also called the Festival of Light, reminding us that Jesus is light of light, very God of very God, and that he is the light that shines in the darkness and, of course, the light of the Christmas star. Over the centuries, most of the events celebrated on Epiphany, like the baptism of Jesus, were spun off to receive their own special day during the developing Epiphany season, leaving us today with our focus on the visit of the Magi. Because the wise men were Gentiles, Epiphany has been called the Gentiles' Christmas. In some places it is called Three Kings Day, based on the tradition that there were three magi visiting the Lord. <clears throat> our pointed lessons for today maintain our current focus on the Gentile magi and the truth that Jesus came for the salvation of all, including those who are not direct physical descendants of Abraham. Paul called this a mystery. At first, this seems rather surprising. If you look at our Old Testament readings of our appointed psalm for today, and our appointed psalm for today, it is quite obvious that God has always intended the salvation of all humanity. Even the gifts these visitors from the East gave were foretold. In Isaiah 62, we hear of the gold and frankincense they bring. In Psalm 72, 10, and 15, we read of the wise men bringing gifts in general, and gold mentioned specifically. Isaiah also refers to the camels the visitors arrived on. So it seems odd to us, at first, that Paul calls the welcome of the Gentiles a mystery. To understand how God's love for all people could be a mystery, we must understand people in general 
and how the fall into sin has impacted us. People tend to be self-centered. We could spend hours giving examples of how this is seen in our culture and add additional hours sharing examples of how history bears out this point, but we don't have time for that. Instead, we will consider just one example and then leave it to each one of us to think of other examples if you desire. Our example today might seem an odd one. It is charitable giving. How, you might ask, can giving for the aid of others, such as hurricane relief or research for the cure of some ailment, reflect a self-centered nature in humanity? And of course, it doesn't automatically do so. However, many appeals for economic support are firmly self-centered. The appeal is made based on how good you will feel about yourself if you just support the charity. Now, who doesn't want to feel good about themselves? But if you are working for a charity simply to feel good about yourself, then the motivation is self-centered. Many well-known people make appeals for specific charities motivated primarily by self-interest. If I have cancer, or a loved one has cancer, suddenly I am an advocate for cancer research. If a loved one has Alzheimer's, then suddenly I am an advocate for Alzheimer's research. If my home was destroyed by a hurricane, then suddenly I am an advocate for hurricane relief. Our self-centered nature actually motivates a great deal of charity. The self-centered aspect of our sin nature explains why the message that the gospel is for all people was a mystery. When the Jews were, what the Jews were interested in is a God, a Jewish God. It was they were interested in God and His relationship with Jews. He was, as I said, the Jewish God. When others asked them about their God. They were happy to tell them that God had chosen their ancestors, delivered them time and time again, and had promised a Messiah who would come and deliver them. They utterly failed to understand the deeper meaning of the name Israel that we heard about in last Sunday's sermon. When the Old Testament spoke of Israel, the Jews understood the descendants of Jacob and not the people of God, all people who believed in the true God. The average person simply took the Jews as a, the word of the Jews as established fact. Few took the time to read the Old Testament and ponder such passages like our lessons from Isaiah and the Psalms. So God's love for all people was a mystery because their sin blinded us to it, because their sin blinded them to it. Because of the real meaning of Israel, Paul could once say, not all who are descendant from Israel, meaning Jacob, belong to Israel, meaning believers in Jesus. As always, it takes divine love and might to pierce the sin-darkened hearts of humanity. In the story of the wise man, we see that happening. The Epiphany Star has received a lot of attention over the years. Many theories have been advanced as to the nature of the star and what exactly was happening in the heavens to create it. Accept what theory you want. The Bible does not answer the question. My opinion is that it was a miracle, pure and simple, and so all natural explanations fall short. However, if you prefer a natural one, I have no problem with that. After all, God has often used purely natural events to convey a confirmation of his promise. Take the rainbow as an example. We can also notice another connection between the Epiphany Star and the rainbow. These signs were intended for all humanity, not just Jews. However, it is significant that the Epiphany Star actually didn't get the job done. It announced to those ancient stargazers that a king had been born to the Jews, but it did not tell them where to find him. Signs in nature can only take us so far. By gazing at nature, we can understand God as powerful, creator, a lover of beauty, 
infinitely smart, and so forth, but we are never brought to him. Nature does not show us the babe in Bethlehem. Nature does not reveal that the babe was God in the flesh. Nature does not reveal that his upcoming death was a substitute for all humanity. Humanity. Indeed, due to our sin nature, many can gaze at a rainbow and think of nothing but natural causes. So the Magi from the re East arrived in Jerusalem and received another missing piece of the puzzle. They heard that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. It was that word from Scripture that the Holy Spirit used to bring these men to the Christ child. The Epiphany Star then confirmed that they had reached their destination. So we find the priority of God's written word used by the Holy Spirit to bring us to saving faith. That word can come to us through a good sermon. It can come to us in a Gideon's Bible in a hotel room. It can come to us in the waters of baptism, which Paul calls the washing of water with the word. It is also the word of Christ that makes the Lord's sacrament a sacrament bringing to us his very body and blood for our forgiveness and therefore spiritual strengthening. That is why we always use the words of our Lord, the ones that he used when he first instituted this sacred meal. Thus, it is also the word of our Lord that puts forgiveness into our absolution. This word of God, which is also called a sword, is swung by the Holy Spirit to kill and make alive, kill our old man, and make alive our new man. When you hold a Bible, you are holding God's epiphany in your hands. Anyway, the Magi welcomed the Christ, who was God in the flesh, and gave him precious gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. From a purely practical perspective, these gifts were probably used to finance the Holy Family as they went into exile in Egypt when King Herod sought to kill the little boy. However, Christian tradition has long seen these gifts as a mysterious confession. The gold confessed that the child was the king God had sent. The frankincense confessed that the child is God himself in human flesh. The gift of myrrh is seen as confessing the atoning death of Jesus. He came to be a sacrifice to offer his life on our behalf. Epiphany, then, is about God manifesting his grace in Christ Jesus to all people. It is about the blinders of sin falling from our eyes so that we can get a better understanding of the marvelous and expansive love of God for us. Epiphany is a taste of John 3.16, where we, re we read, For God so loved the world not just the physical descendants of Jacob. It is a foretaste of the Great Commission, where we are told to go and make disciples of all nations, not just those who call themselves Jews. It is also a reminder that, through Christ, Abraham became a blessing to all nations, not just his physical descendants. What is Epiphany? It is all this. It is the revelation that God came in human flesh for all people. That includes you. That includes me. It also includes all who call themselves Jews today. It includes all who call themselves Muslims. It includes all who call themselves Hindus. It includes all who call themselves communists. It includes all who call themselves Republicans. It includes all who call themselves Democrats. It includes all who call themselves homosexuals. It includes all who call themselves Africans, or Americans, or Colombians, or Chinese, or any other nationality. It includes all who have Alzheimer's, or cancer, or MS, or are drug users, or are trapped in human trafficking, as well as the human traffickers. The list goes on and on because Christ came for all. Epiphany is the celebration that God loves us all, came in the flesh for us all, and all who receive him in faith receive the forgiveness he merited. So we celebrate Epiphany. We and all believers and pray that more and more 
may be brought to faith in Jesus, who is the star of our faith. May the peace that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.